Okay, today we're going to talk to you about long-term care facility associated infections in the geriatric population. We're going to concentrate on UTIs, pneumonia, skin, soft tissue infections because these make up 94% of all infections. Now, for urinary tract infections, you all should know that the Foley catheter as a 3 to 10 percent bacteriuria per day, 10 to 25 percent UTIs, 4 percent bacteremias, cloudy urine, pyuria, fever, mental status changes, hypotension, acidosis, or even alkalosis. Um, remember those concepts. The pyuria is present when you have a symptomatic UTI with a chronic urinary tract infection. Pyuria absence, this is very important, excludes symptomatic UTI. Okay, the absence. The presence doesn't guarantee it, but the absence rules it out. Bacteria asymptomatic, treating that is not beneficial. All you do is cause resistance. So this is the key, is, is this asymptomatic bacteria or is, it, or is it a true UTI? And prophylactic antibiotics are not beneficial, and again, they promote resistance. So at Moffitt, uh, you can see our problem, which is mirrors the rest of the world. Quinolone and E. coli resistance is approaching 50%. And so what drugs are you going to use in this setting? Klebsiella hasn't been as bad as you can see. So when you think of cystitis, UTIs, E. coli's, don't forget Enterococcus, Pseudomonas, and then sometimes Coag negative staph, Klebsiella proteus. Here's what your bladder looks like with a chronic UTI with lots of crypts where bacteria can live. You can do a gram stain if you suspect pyelonephritis because you can get results within hours. It'll tell you is there gram negative rods, is there gram positive coccyne clusters and chains, and it might give you an idea while you're waiting. Now, Radiographically, an ultrasound will show kidney enlargement for pylo, and you may or may not see lesions if there's abscesses chronically. And then the CT, you want to look for wedge-shaped lesions. So here's a CAT scan. Notice the arrow. Wedge-shaped lesions indicate pyelonephritis, usually unilateral. If you were to biopsy the kidney, which we don't do, here's what you would see. The neutrophils invading the uh, glomeruli as well as where the tubules are. Now, the biggest complication of pyelonephritis is a perinephric abscess, which may require drainage. And if there's obstruction in there, staghorn calculus, those are the classic proteus, urease splitters, staghorn calculus. And if you have a big bag of pus, um, that's a chronic infection from obstruction. Chronic pylo does not typically cause renal failure, but you can get progressive renal insufficiency. And then uh, people that are chronic Foley's, chronic UTIs, the glomeruli are almost absence in this kidney. Now, if you have gas in the kidney, that's called what? emphysematous pyelonephritis and what are the gas producing bugs E. coli Klebsiella remember Clostridium is not usually in the kidney here's your kidney full of gas bubbles usually this requires nephrectomy surgical emergency notice the gas in the kidneys and on autopsy guess what grew E. coli emphysematous pyelonephritis so what are the leading causes E. coli Kleb rarely other gram negatives rarely Clostridium or Canada. If you have gas in your bladder, we call that what? Emphysema and cystitis. Okay, if you have gas in your gallbladder, we call that emphysema and cholecystitis. Cholecystitis. See the gas in the gallbladder? Now notice Clostridium is one-third of cases. Uh, e. coli Kleb still dominates. Diabetes is the number one uh, factor with emphysematous changes infectious wise in any organ. Now here's a hot question for you. I got a guy that's had recurrent Klebsiella UTIs over a year intermittent treatment and um, he has some fever back pain and they do a CT and his kidney looks totally distorted and they think it's a kidney cancer so they want to cut the thing out and it looks bizarre, very strange looking kidney. Slice it open, it looks very strange. And then here's the clue, foamy macrophages. No, this is not Whipple's. Foamy macrophages. Any guess? And there's this stuff accumulating in there from this chronic infection. So this is called xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis. 
It's also known as a renal phlegmon pseudotumor. The classic bugs are E. coli, Proteus, Klebs, Pseudomonas. It's 1% of all renal infections. 75% are obstructed. The foamy macrophage is your key if you do a kidney biopsy. Uh, you may get fistula formation. Um, CID did an article which said you may not have to do a nephrectomy, which was always the standard of care. You could do a partial nephrectomy or try antibiotics for long term. So remember, xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis. Now, <clears throat> here's some concepts. Catheter replacement. Uh, they looked at 54 long-term care facility patients, chronic Foley, uh, improved clinical status replacement 93% versus 41 no replacement at 72 hours. Relapse 11% replacement, 41% no replacement. This has to do with a UTI. We don't just change. By the way, how often should you change a Foley catheter? What's the literature say? You don't. That's, that's crazy, you think, but you don't. Now, obviously, you can get concretions, and then you can't pull it out. But if it's malfunctioning, you change it. But do not routinely change chronic Foley's. However, here's an order you should always remember. If there's a Foley and there's a UTI, right, change Foley catheter. Here's your reason why, OK? Now, when we think of sepsis, some of these people can develop urosepsis. You know the terms. SIR, sepsis, severe sepsis, septic shock. Uh, sometimes we still use this. Billing still requires this. And when we think of that, um, we have to decide, is there multi-organ dysfunction? Is the lab showing kidney dysfunction? Are they uh, showing tachypnea, confusion, etc.? And when we think of um, people that are septic, which sepsis has the highest mortality? Respiratory, which one has the least? Urinary and abdomens in between. Uh, by the way, biliary sepsis is similar to urine. Um, and then when you do get sepsis, we think of enterococcus, fungi, gram negatives, polymicrobials. Uh, these are all uh, common bugs. Now, Canada and the urine, how common is that? Well, 1.3% um, risk of canademia. So most people with candida in their urine do not get a bad infection. 40% mortality, though, if they do get candidemia. The quantity of yeast in the urine, pseudohyphae, and pyuria do not distinguish colonization from infection. Two weeks of treatment is indicated if you believe this is a symptomatic, uncomplicated UTI. So for candida, usually they have a Foley. Usually we say change the Foley and don't necessarily treat it. Okay. However, if you think it's the cause, you can treat it. And then the treatment's usually fluconazole, great drug penetration in the urine. And then it gets very controversial. What do you do if it's flucon resistant? I'm still an akinocandin believer, but the books say it doesn't get into the urine because it's metabolized through the liver, but it still works. And there is some large series showing it works for pyelonephritis. Uh, Ampho B obviously would work if you're not nephrotoxic. Bladder irrigation with Ampho B is also controversial. It used to be popular, now it's going away. It doesn't seem to get into the kidney, so it doesn't help you with pylo. Now, this is what pseudohyphae would look like in your urine, budding pseudohyphae. Here's kidney uh, full of Canada, so it does occur, so we can't just blow it off all the time. And when we think of UTI, albicans dominates, and we should know what's the number two most common bug after albicans is glabrata. And then the mortality is the least with parapsilosis, the worst with cruzii, and then we got everything in between. Remember, Canada cruzii and some glabratas tend to be more flucon resistant, whereas the echinocandans, they're pretty stable across the board except parapsilosis. And then vorconazole, also excreted through the liver, uh, is a good drug except some glabrata resistance. Now, next topic, pneumonia in these uh, long-term care facility patients. Higher mortality in the elderly than uh, community. Uh, COPD, CHF aspiration is more common. The one-year mortality was 75% versus 40% control. So pneumonia is the big killer of elderly people in long-term care facilities. Uh, risk factors is sedating medication and witness aspiration. 
Here's an obvious case of sinusitis, which also occurs viral infections, that centrilobular nodularity. So when we think of viruses, yes, they do spread in long-term care facilities, influenza being the one that we all know about with outbreaks occurring, but all the other ones could also easily spread. And then we are in the month of January, so you can see a whole lot of viruses are now circulating throughout the community. And this is what influenza and pneumonia would look like when people are dying with it with ARDS. And if you don't get the treatment started, the mortality goes up, especially in the elderly. So when you think of people that have complications of influenza, the asthmatic, the COPD, the immunosuppressed, the cardiac disease, pregnancy, diabetes, obesity, and this was the H1N1, and elderly is always on the list, except they were actually protected against H1N1. The complications have included empyema, necrotizing pneumonia, bacterial co-infections, ventilator-associated pneumonias, and the bugs are usually strep, pneumonia, group A strep, occasionally mitis, staph, MRSA, gram-negatives, and even aspergillus. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, when you look at the people that were hospitalized and sick, Notice how many people were young, whereas the elderly were not represented at 7% versus seasonal flu, which was 60%. Look at the, the deaths, which were exact opposite, 12%, 65 and older, 90% for seasonal flu. So this was the exact opposite of what you would have seen. So uh, other larger series, when you look at the actual ages, you can see that the elderly did not make up the majority. It was the younger people. And so that was the opposite of what everyone was seeing. And then this is sort of saying the same thing again in a different way. Predictions of death, elderly not as high as the others. Now this is uh, pneumococcal pneumonia, which can occur uh, in our patients, sometimes causing purpura fulminans, especially if there's no spleen, the quinolones have great coverage except Cipro. Remember, that's the big hole in therapy. A lot of our patients may have emphysema. What's the second most common cause of community-acquired pneumonia after strep pneumo? Gram-negative coccobacilli, what is that? Haemophilus, usually non-typable, which also has had problems in the elderly with high mortality. Latest data, non-haemophilus, non-typable haemophilus, Elderly patients, bad outcomes, pneumonia, so it's not as benign as we think. And then when you have a viral infection, it damages your mucociliary escalator, which constantly pushes stuff out of your lungs. And see that damage area? That's where what bugs love to bind to that. Homophilus, Staph aureus, and Strep pneumo. Those are the three that like to follow viral pneumonias. Of course, Gram-negative pneumonia, healthcare-associated pneumonia are also a concern, all the way up to pseudomonas, which can cause a necrotizing pneumonia. Now, if you look at ventilator-associated pneumonias, notice Staph aureus leads the list. However, colonization occurs in 25% of people, so could be colonization, could be the cause of the pneumonia. And then two is pseudomonas, and then you got a race for number three, Acinetobacter, Enterobacter, and Klebsiella. And then this is the bad old Staph aureus following influenza with the necrotizing pneumonia occurring six days later. Uh, and the virulence factor is PVL, Panthen Valentine leukocyte. Notice the mortality five times greater if it's PVL positive than if it's negative. All right, 70-year-old chronic cough, hemoptysis, acquired, acquired this bug from the shower head or water heater. So these patients are sitting in long-term care facilities, and they've had this for years and years. So there's your hot tub and your water heater, and that's your nodules with your bronchiectasis. So that's Lady Windermere syndrome, mycobacterium avium intracellulari, and there is the treatment combination therapy. Now, rashes, skin and soft tissue infections. What are the bugs? MRSA, group A strep, occasionally wounds with multi-drug resistant gram-negative pseudomonas, decubiti, herpes, varicella, conjunctivitis, ectoparasites, tinea, and allergies. So here's what the community-acquired MRSA would look like, that black necrotic lesion blamed for a spider bite. 
and it not only causes lung but skin infections, osteobacteremia cellulitis, same thing, PVL positive is the problem with the high mortality. These are what boils or furuncles would look like. And notice community acquired is much more likely to cause a skin and soft tissue infection, much less likely to be colonizing you because of its virulence. And the treatment is Doxy, Septra, for the most part, and Vanco, Zyvox, Dapto for more serious infections. The brown recluse has the violin on the back, and if it bites you, here's what happens over time. That is a very toxin producing necrotic kind of infection that looks like a bad infection but it's not it's the toxin of the brown recluse now myth buster staph aureus colonization is more common in healthcare workers true or false uh, false we all have MRSA is a false statement <coughs> you're either <coughs> excuse me intermittently colonized or chronically colonized they did a study in a nursing home and found that there was 3% colonization of MRSA in those people caring for patients with 60% of them full of MRSA and they were no more likely than the um, general community. What, what work group is at high risk for MRSA? Right. Which is ET. <laughs> the um, ambulance drivers, the firemen, the emergency response people, and ER personnel have been found to be more likely colonized with MRSA up to 10 to 15 percent. Otherwise, everyone's pretty much equal. Uh, another study found that, again, staph forest colonization is just like the community, 28, 30 percent, 25, 30 percent, 2 percent MRSA positive. So that's a myth. Don't forget, just like in the, any other population, the elderly can have problems with MRSA. The higher the MIC, the failure rate goes way up. So we have to look at the MIC when we have an active MRSA infection. What is your cocktail for decolonization? Doxycycline or Bactrim plus Bactroban or Mupirosone ointment plus Chlorhexidine, still pretty much the standard works to decolonize people if they need decolonization. Notice the bottom 60 percent of staph aureus in long-term care facilities are MRSA. Okay, so MRSA is very common in this setting as is gram-negative rods. <clears throat> Excuse me, once you're admitted um, and you screen everybody on admission, 20 to 25 percent uh, may be positive, 10 percent will become positive while they're staying there and um, there's a almost two times greater cost of managing a MRSA infection versus MSSA. So where can you go to avoid MRSA? Answer is Netherlands and Canada. Otherwise it's a global problem in Lebanon. Okay, I think it's still there. Okay, VRE, <clears throat> that's another problem. Um, all these drugs predispose you to increase logarithmically VRE in your intestinal tract. True VRE infections are rare in the elderly, usually the urine, if it's not colonization, and even bacteremias and wound infections. Uh, quinolones promote VRE overgrowth. So decubitus ulcers, uh, there's stages one through four depending on the depth. These are what they look like. Closure is very important. Wound vacs have revolutionized decubiti management to try to get those wounds to close as well as uh, muscle skin flaps and this is the idea of a wound vac trying to get that granulation tissue to close while you pull the fluid out and debreed all that dead tissue in there and close it up with those muscle flaps. Now uh, remember for um, pressure ulcers colonization precedes infection. Normally it's sort of like burn patients. It's normal skin flora, staph coagulative diphtheroids, and then eventually the environmental bug, the fecal contaminants, and then you start to see the gram negatives, the anaerobes, the MRSA, the VRE, and the Canada. Now, when you get real sophisticated, some people do uh, quantitative cultures of the tissue. If you have a greater than 100,000 colony forming units per gram of tissue, 
uh, that will inhibit wound healing and that may indicate signs of infection. If you debride it regularly, your colony counts can be less than 100 colonary forming units per gram of tissue. Uh, remember that when you're swabbing the surface and you're growing all these bugs, that doesn't necessarily correlate with what's deep down in there or osteo, except if you grow Staph aureus or MRSA, uh, that usually when you culture the cubid eye, you will grow all kinds of organisms there. And um, in general, we don't recommend swabbing that, except if you're doing surveillance or you think someone's septic with multi-drug resistant bugs and you want to broaden your coverage. Uh, this was the study that was mentioning about a swab versus a deep culture of a decubit eye. The surface swab was guaranteed to grow something. A needle aspirate was 43% of the deep tissue biopsy was 63%. And then um, when people like spinal cord injury patients, when they have bacteremia, they traced it to the decubit eye in 17% of patients. Um, and then when they looked at 21 of those patients with sepsis syndrome associated with the cubit eye, 16 had positive blood cultures. Uh, 44 HIV patients with the cubit eye, 12 had bacteremia, 6 were the source of the decubit eye. And if you have bacteremia from your decubit eye, your mortality is uh, 30 to 50 percent. So that's nothing uh, to disregard there. And then um, all of your spinal cord centers have algorithms about there's a decubit eye, is there osteomyelitis, do we need a bone biopsy, what test do we do, debridement, closure, systemic antibiotics, so um, there is algorithms for that. Other infections, skin soft tissue that you'll see in the elderly, especially in the uh, nursing home setting, long-term care facility, unilateral swelling of your face is Peritidis, if you don't drain it, it'll drain itself. So you want to probe Stenson's duct, get all the pus out of there, mucus and the um, stones, and then milk the parotid. And then don't forget to prescribe lemon drops to get them to salivate, called a sialagog. The bug is usually MRSA. Other rashes that are common in the elderly are rosacea. The bulbous nose is called rhinophyma. This is typical rosacea, bulbous nose, and then before and after, what did she take? Topical metronidazole, metrogel, right? Doxycycline, clindamycin, and then telangiectasias occur chronically. Uh, elderly can have the lupus look-alike rash, which is erysipelas, except lupus, remember, spares the nasolabial fold. Erysipelas does not. Here's a lady with erysipelas. Treat it with good old penicillin, okay? Bell's palsy, elderly. What's the bug? Herpes simplex. Treatment is not acyclovir. It's prednisone, right? And then you want to reduce the um, paralysis prednisone. If you have vesicles in the external ear canal with facial paralysis, what's the syndrome? Ramsey Hunt, yes, do give the Famvir Valtrex, and remember, double the dose for zoster over simplex. Pus draining out of the ear of a diabetic, what's the syndrome? Malignant otitis externa, the bug is pseudomonas, it can cause a basal or skull osteomyelitis. And if you got fungus mold growing in your ear and you're healthy, what's that? Aspergillus niger, it loves the moist environment of your ear. Okay, what's the malignant otitis externa look alike? Relapsing polychondritis, and how do you know visually? It spares the, that lobe where you put your earrings because there's no cartilage in there, right? All right, and then what else has cartilage? The nose, the trachea, and the costochondral junction in the even though there's no cartilage there, you get uveitis, okay? And it tends to be more bilateral than unilateral. So relapsing polychondritis, there's no blood test. Okay, what do you call an infection of the hair of your eyelid? Hordeolum and a mabobium gland infection is a chalazion. They like to give doxycycline for four weeks for that and warm compresses for the hordeolum. Okay, what are the two causes of pink eye, red eye spread through the nursing home readily? So 
Enterovirus, acute hemorrhagic conjunctivitis, contagious for five to seven days. The bad one is adenovirus, contagious for four weeks, epidemic keratoconjunctivitis. If you see this, we start to get very nervous. What is that? Right, scabies. And this is where it likes to show up. Okay, wrist, axilla, antecubital. And then there's the bug, the egg, and the stool. There's the scabi there. And then if you're very immune suppressed, you can have Norwegian or crusted scabies. Okay, billions of organisms, and they can spread readily. Treatment is permethrin, uh, crotomitin. Uh, if you're really bad off, oral ivermectin kills them promptly. And you may still be itching weeks late, later. You want to cover the whole body and brush it into the fingernails. Okay, How are you going to explain someone to apply this stuff? Okay, this can occur anywhere, including in long-term care facilities. And if you see this, there's ants could be in there. But what else? Bed bugs. Cymex lectularis. Okay, bed bugs. This is what it would look like, especially in a linear fashion. And that's typically where you find it. These are bed bugs. That's what they look like. They do not transmit disease, although they may be colonized with MRSA and other bacteria. So bed bugs travel readily with the baggage, motels, hotels, hospitals, homes, and long-term care facilities. They, like, um, they leave a tar-like, sweet-smelling odor which may become offensive in heavy infestations. And they like the crevices, cracks, the mattress springs, and bed clothes. Okay. What about this rash is tinea, right? So this is tinea corporis, and that's a dermatophyte infection. What if you have a dermatophyte infection that has a aberrant granulomatous response? That's called a a carrion, carrion. So carrion is a dermatophyte infection with a hypersensitivity immune response. May have secondary infection. All right, rashes, tinea curris. See the satellite lesions. This one is tin. Or excuse me, back that up. Canada inner trigo. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, tinea curris, the scallop borders, no satellite lesions. And then um, this one here, the rash does not get better with antifungals. So you get your ultraviolet woods lamp and it gives you coral pink fluorescence. So that is erythrasma. Corinibacterium or Arcanobacterium minutissimum, right? Uh, okay, what's this rash? Tinea versicolor, spaghetti and meatballs. There's the bug. There's the organism after you add the olive oil. So, Malassezia furfur, tinea versicolor. All right. Don't forget when you're putting on cuts and injuries, polysporin, the neomycin, can cause a contact dermatitis. I've seen dermatologists after they do biopsy, they say, do not put on my biopsy site polysporin or neosporin because they don't want to get called that it's getting dramatically worse. It mimics the cellulitis. So they say put bacitracin on it. Don't put neomycin on it because one in a thousand people will get contact dermatitis. Okay, the knife cut sign in the intertriginous folds. What's that? Herpes, atypical presentations of herpes. That knife cut sign, especially in that intertriginal area, and so we want to remember the knife cut sign, which can occur in immunosuppressed and immunocompetent. Okay, ulcers on the palate, herpes, thrush can also occur, and black, brown, and white hairy tongue, lingua villosa, which mimics thrush. A lot of the elderly uh, ill patients will have lingua villosa and be misdiagnosed as thrush. And it's caused by everything from cancer to tobacco to coffee to antibiotics to HIV.